Hello everyone, Mrs. Quattro here, and we are going to go over uh, topics 1.1 through 1.3 um, in a little bit more detail. You are not going to be watching a video over 1.1 because it's a lot of it should be review for you um, since you've taken biology before or if you took environmental science before, um, then some of this should be review for you. Um, so we're going to just talk about it here a bit. I do recommend you take notes as we go along. It's, you know, it's a video so you can pause it whenever you need to in order to write down the information from the slides. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started and talk about ecosystems. So one of the things that you will have noticed since you started watching um, the, the videos as, as your homework is that uh, you will see these uh, learning objectives and essential knowledge pieces and suggested skills. So um, if you don't know what these are, um, basically your objective, your learning objective is what you should be able to um, to do at the end of whatever we're talking about. So you should be able to explain the availability of resource influences um, and how they interact with or how they affect species interactions. So you should be able to talk about how resources and interactions kind of work together. Um, the skill um, is being able to describe an environmental concept or process. This is kind of the bigger picture. So there's a concept and a process that goes along with these um, resource influences and then interactions and can you describe them. And then the essential knowledge pieces or the EKs as you see here are the things that you should know by the end of whatever we're talking about. So at the end of this lecture you should know that there is a predator-prey relationship. The predator is the organism that eats the other organism which is the prey. You should know that symbiosis is a, is a close and long-term interaction between two species in an ecosystem, and that the types of symbiosis are mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. And then finally, that competition can occur within or between species in an ecosystem where there's limited resources. Something called resource partitioning, which is using the resources in different ways, places, or at different times, can reduce the negative impact of competition on survival. And we'll talk about all of these in a little bit more detail as we go on right now. Um, you don't need to necessarily write these this stuff down, but the, the essential knowledge pieces are, you know, the, the parts that you should know by the end of this. Kind of a really quick summary of what you should know. All right, so we do have some ecosystem basics. Um, we move from you know a smaller organism here, the individual, all the way up to the biosphere. So let's talk about those just vocab words. So when we're talking about an individual, we're talking about one organism. In this picture, we're talking about the elk. So an individual is one organism. Where a population is a group of individuals, but of the same species. So you can see here, this is a, an elk herd, um, but they're all the same species. As you look bigger into the ecosystem, you have communities, which are all living organisms in an area. So you might have a moose and the elk herd and um, a, a rabbit here, a jackrabbit, um, an owl. All of those living organisms are a part of the community. And then don't forget the trees as well. Anything that's living is a part of a community. An ecosystem includes all living and non-living things in an area as well. So this is not only the plants and animals that are living, but also rocks, soil, water, air, all of those make up an ecosystem. And then the larger area that we kind of stick to and where we really hang out is a biome. Um, and uh, biomes will come into talk uh, when we're talking about topics 1.2 1, 1 and 1.3. Um, so biomes are large areas with similar climate conditions that determine the plants and animal species that are there. So an example of a biome that you might have heard about is a tropical rainforest. And the climate conditions really determine what can live there. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit bit. So there are different types of organism interactions that you need to know about. Um, so let's talk about those. So you do have, uh, let's start off with competition. Um, this is where organisms are fighting over a resource like food or shelter um, or mates or water. Um, and this will limit a population size because of that competition. Um, so what these positives and negatives and then in a minute the, the zero mean is that competition is, is not good for either one of the species because this does limit the population size. 
if you're busy fighting over food or trying to find uh, a place to live, um, you know, some sort of shelter to protect you, then you're, you're, you're competing with another organism and someone is going to lose out. So this isn't a good thing necessarily for either organism. Predation is where one organism uses another for energy sources. So you're probably thinking of like um, a lion chasing, you know, a gazelle. That's an example of predation. Um, but think about as well hunters, um, humans, parasites, and then even herbivores. Uh, that's a type of predation. So herbivores are organisms that eat only plants. Um, that is a type of predation because that organism is using another for an energy source. So when a rabbit eats a plant, uh, it is using that organism for an energy source. So for predation, one species gets that, that energy, so it's good for that one species, and then bad for the prey that is being eaten. You have mutualism, which is a relationship, um, an organism interaction, a relationship that benefits both organisms like a coral reef. Um, so um, basically with the coral reef, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a few slides, what that specifically looks like. Um, but if you think about um, Finding Nemo, um, <laughs> with their, when we talk about ecosystems, you can bring a lot of this back to um, the Lion King and Finding Nemo. Um, mutualism is good for both organisms. So the coral reef has um, algae that grow on the coral, and it is a benefit for both the algae and the coral, which is why you have two positives here, um, because it helps both organisms survive. And again, we'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. And then lastly, the last organism interaction is commensalism. Um, this is a relationship that benefits one organism and then doesn't really impact the other positively or negatively. So it's good for one and just kind of eh, whatever for the other. So birds nesting in trees, it's good for the bird. Um, it has, that's its habitat. That's it's where it's where it's living. Um, it's its shelter, but the tree, eh, it doesn't really matter. It's not hurting the tree. It's not helping the tree. It just is what it is. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about predation and the breakdown of all of that. I'm gonna load up that just for a minute. Um, so we have herbivores, I already kind of got into that. Herbivores are plant eaters, they eat plants for energy. An example of that is a giraffe and a tree. This should be familiar to you. This is a term you've probably heard your entire life, so um, I'm not really gonna go into that in any more detail. You should know what an herbivore is at this point. Um, true predators, uh, also known as carnivores, kill and eat their prey for energy. So an example is a leopard and a giraffe. Um, the leopard is the predator, the giraffe is the prey. And then a parasite um, is another form of predation. Um, so using a host organism for energy, um, often without killing the host and then living inside the host. So it wouldn't be beneficial to kill the host because that's where you're getting its energy. So an example of this that you're probably very familiar with is mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are parasites. Um, we are often the host. Um, so host organism that is, feeds off of us, that mosquito biting us and feeding off of us, um, but it doesn't kill us um, unless we develop a disease, but that's a different situation. It can't drain us of blood. Um, tapeworms live inside of hosts, um, so you get those from um, drinking or eating um, food or water that has tapeworms in there, um, of tapeworm eggs, or ingesting feces, and they will live inside of the host but not kill the host. And the picture you see here is a, is a sea lamprey. Um, these black things sucking off of the fish is uh, a sea lamprey and they are um, attached to the fish with little, little uh, well not little, they're kind of big teeth, <laughs> um, that attach into the fish and uh, uh, they're just drinking the blood off of it, but it's not killing the fish. Um, and then parasitoids. Um, so these lay eggs inside of a host organism. Um, so the eggs will hatch and then the larvae will eat that host for energy. That's what's happening here in this picture. This is a parasitic wasp um, injecting its eggs um, into the head region of the caterpillar. Um, and what will happen is the eggs will hatch and then eat the caterpillar. It's pretty nasty stuff. Um, bot flies do the same thing. Um, they ingest, or inject excuse me their um, uh, eggs inside of a host organism and then 
uh, that that area around wherever the bot fly is, wherever the larvae is, will eat uh, the skin or, or the entire organism itself. All right, let's talk about the term symbiosis. Um, so um, there are many types of symbiosis that we're going to talk about, but basically symbiosis um, is where an organism is living together, living together, and osis means condition. So symbiosis is organisms that are living together. Um, and there are a couple of different types of symbiosis that we're going to talk about. So any close or long-term and long-term interaction between organisms of different species, of a different species, is symbiosis. So the, there any, any sort of long-term interaction um, is symbiosis. And there are three that we're going to talk about, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. All of these are types of symbiotic relationships. So mutualism, um, this is the coral that I was just talking about just a moment ago. Um, so mutualism is organisms of a different species living together and they're both benefiting. So what I was talking about earlier was that coral, which are actually, they're animals, if you did not know, they are not plants. Most people think that coral are plants, but they are not, they are animals. They are, they are living, they make up, um, the way they're broken down, they make up uh, a living animal. So. Um, they provide the reef with structure and then carbon dioxide for algae. Um, and the algae live on the coral um, and, uh, oh, that's a lichen. I'll get to that in a second. Um, sorry, I thought there was another picture of, of coral. Um, but basically the algae live on that coral um, and the algae provide sugar for the coral because coral are animals so they need sugar to survive they do cellular respiration like we do um, and so they provide that sugar to the coral so that the coral can survive and so they're both feeding one another um, and this picture kind of goes into that in a bit more detail if you want to read about that another type of mutualism is something called a lichen um, this is a composite organism of fungi so a type of fungi living with algae um, and that algae do the same kind of thing they provide sugar um, for the fungi and then the fungi provide the nutrients for the lichen and that's what a uh, lichen look like right here um, all of this growing up is is lichen living on fungi you have competition um, as well. So competition is reducing the population size since there are fewer resources available and fewer organisms can survive. So when you don't have access to, you know, an uh, unlimited supply of resources, your population is going to decrease. If we had all of the resources, food, shelter, mates that we need, then the population is just gonna keep growing. But these limiting resources make it so that the population size is going to decrease because fewer organisms just can't, they just can't survive as much. So um, there are a couple of things that go into place to try and reduce competition because competition, you know, we're not trying to compete in nature. We're trying to increase population size. We're trying to survive in nature. Um, that's the goal of all organisms is to survive. Um, so you're trying to reduce that competition. And some of the ways that we do that is called uh, resource partitioning. So resource partitioning is where different species um, use the same resource in different ways to reduce the competition. So the same resource like food, like shelter, in different ways. Um, so that's resource partitioning. Um, so temporal partitioning is using the resource at different times. Um, so an example of this is going to be wolves and coyotes. So wolves and coyotes hunt the same kind of food. Um, so it wouldn't be helpful for them to hunt at the same time because then there'd be a bunch of competition. Somebody's going to lose out and somebody's not going to survive. So what has happened is over time and through evolution, um, wolves will hunt at nighttime, coyotes hunt during the day, and in the end, and they both get um, you know the the same type of food um, and they're able to reduce that competition it was spatial partitioning which is using different areas of a shared habitat so an example are different root lengths so for example this type of grass the root length only goes in about half of a meter where the tar bush is going in down three meters now 
keep in mind, obviously, all of this are, these are full of nutrients. That soil is full of nutrients that both of these plants need to survive. Um, and if they were at the same level, if everything was at that half meter, then all the nutrients from here would be taken and neither would do well. But because the tar bush has um, the root lengths that go down much further, um, both of these plants can survive in that spatial partitioning. Um, here's an example of resource partitioning um, where the resources are used in different ways. Um, so uh, this is a very, very common example. Again, this is spatial partitioning. So these warblers, um, different types of birds, are on the same tree. These are all the same tree. And, but they will position themselves um, in these yellowy areas. So this warbler hangs out at the top and along the edges where this one hangs out at the bottom. So that way they have access to food and shelter, but they're not competing with one another. They're getting everything that they need. And then there's morpholo morphological partitioning, which is using different resources based on different evolved body features. So for example, this black-footed ferret has a very long front teeth um, where the erm canines basically with the ermine um, is not nowhere near as large um, you can even just see head size the ermine is much smaller so the ermine is able to eat smaller things where the black-footed ferret eats larger things and that's just because of how morphologically their bodies have evolved to eat different things in order to survive um, and reduce that competition Okay, so that's all of 1.1, topic 1.1, Introduction to Ecosystems. Most of that should have been familiar to you. You probably don't know much about resource partitioning, but hopefully now you do. Um, so we're going to talk about 1.2 and 1.3. You should have already watched videos over topics 1.2, which is terrestrial biomes, and 1.3, which are aquatic biomes. You should have already watched videos, uh, I believe, last week about that or earlier this week um, and, or read in your book about that as well, either, either one. Um, and taking notes over that. So what I want you to do is I want you to add to your notes because there's going to be things in here that were not discussed in the videos. Uh, or And if you read in the book, then some of this is probably familiar to you, but I'm going to hit on some specific things that I want you to focus on. So let's start with topic 1.2, terrestrial or land biomes. Um, so your goal is to be able to, your learning objective is to be able to describe the global distribution and principal environmental aspects of terrestrial biomes. We're still focusing on explaining environmental concepts and processes. By the end of this, you should be able to, um, to do the fall or to, excuse me, to know the following, that a biome contains characteristic communities of plants and animals that result from and are adapted to its climate. The major terrestrial biomes that you will need to know are including the taiga, temperate rainforest, temperate seasonal forest, tropical rainforest, shrubland, temperate grasslands, savanna, desert, and tundra. The global distribution of non-mineral terrestrial natural resources such as water and trees for lumber varies because of some combination of climate, geography, latitude, altitude, nutrient availability, and soil. And finally, the worldwide distribution of biomes is dynamic, meaning it changes. Uh, the distribution has changed in the past and may shift again as a result of global climate change. All right, so a definition for a biome. Again, just as a reminder for you, it's an area that shares a combination of average yearly temperatures and precipitation. So climate, just like what the definition of climate is overall, is temperature and precipitation. So a biome is sharing an average yearly temperature and precipitation. So that area will have um, the simil similar temperatures and precipitation, similar climates. Some examples of biomes that we've already talked about and hopefully you already know these, rainforest, the taiga, temperate deciduous forest, um, the tundra, the desert, grasslands. We in Oklahoma, we live in the grasslands. That is our biome. Um, the community of organisms, both plants and animals in a biome, are uniquely adapted to live in that biome. So some examples um, are camels and cacti um, have water preserving traits. So they are able to survive in a desert a lot better than another organism like a flowering plant um, or um, 
a or an organism that isn't able to pre- preserve water, um, they're able to survive because they have that ability since there's very little precipitation that occurs in the desert. Um, and when it does happen, it's for it's, it's a lot at once and then nothing for a very long time. Um, shrubs and wildflowers store lots of energy in their roots to recover quickly from fire and grasslands. So we have, as you know, um, fires that occur naturally. There are some that occur unnaturally, obviously, but grassland fires are actually a natural thing and they're good for the environment. Um, and so shrubs and wildflowers in these areas are able to recover from fire very quickly and do quite well. So we do have some biome characteristics that you'll want to know about. Um, Just this this is a common common graph that you'll see, a common chart that you'll see when talking about biomes and the characteristics of different biomes. So in general, looking here, you have increasing precipitation along the the y-axis and decreasing temperature along the x-axis. So um, along this general area, you get hot and dry. So it's um, not, it's, it's real hot here, not a lot of water. So we're talking about deserts are generally in this region. As you increase, you are still really hot, but now you've got a lot more precipitation. So we're talking about rainforests. And then as it gets colder, but not a lot of precipitation, you're talking about taiga, so icy, icy and cold areas. So again, along here, this kind of just breaks down for you where those are located and what their average temperatures and precipitations are. Um, that is how we define biomes, is what is the average and average annual precipitation and temperature, because we're always talking about climate. That's what makes a biome. Um, we can predict where on earth biomes are found using this type of chart. So if we know um, what the weather is, or excuse me, what the climate is like, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether it's dry, whether it's rainy, we can predict where it's going to be found on earth. So here is a map of the biomes on earth. um, And you have a a key here to break down those locations. So you have the tundra and boreal areas. Um, You do need to know the latitudes of these regions. So um, you should know that tundra and boreal area are in the higher latitudes, so 60 degrees plus. Um, So north, it's about 60 to 90 degrees. You're going to find the tundra and the boreal forest in these regions. Notice that that just stretches all the way across Earth, um, all the way around. So... um, We'll see that when we look at grasslands too. So temperate, we're talking about mid latitude. So from 30 to 60 degrees um, above the equator, north and south, you're talking about the temperate areas. So here is where our grasslands are along here um, in these regions. If we can find the grasslands, excuse me, if I can find it. Ah, there we go, right there. So yeah, this color right here are grasslands and then notice that that is the same thing along this region here. And then lastly is tropical closer to the equator. So you're talking from zero to 30 degrees um, is where you're going to see the tropical regions. Again, this stretches all the way across uh, or around the earth. Um, So if you don't know the term latitude, you do need to know that. So this is the distance from the equator. Um, This is what determines temperature and precipitation, which is why biomes exist in predictable patterns. Um, We'll talk more about um, latitude when we get to unit four um, and why temperature and precipitation happens specifically in certain areas so like why is it so rainy around the equator we'll talk about that more when we get into unit four but at this point just know that um, the latitude is determining the temperature and the precipitation and that's what makes the biome exist in that region all right Another thing you want to know about is nutrient availability. So plants obviously need soil nutrients to grow, um, which so the availability makes it so certain plants can survive in certain areas. So for example, um, in the frozen soils of the tundra, you don't get a lot of nutrients there. Um, so the, the dead matter, the dead organic matter, um, it's it's not broken down easily because it's frozen um so you have the soil and the tundra is really low in nutrients 
low water availability because it doesn't rain a lot, very few plants survive here. Um, so you get this area that's called permafrost. So this entire area is just completely frozen with a big ice wedge right here. So this tiny little bit right here is the only area that's actually active with, with uh, growing plants at any point in time. Now, as this melts due to global warming, this is releasing carbon dioxide and methane into our, um, into our atmosphere, which is increasing um, global climate change. We'll get into that a whole bunch more a little bit later, but I do want to kind of get that in your mind that if this if this unfreezes, if this melts, it is not good for our environment. Um, but as far as nutrients available, of you know that are available, they plants can't grow into this. This is totally frozen, so they only have this tiny little area. This is what it looks like. So notice no tall trees. There are no trees in these areas. There's low growing shrubs, um, and that's pretty much all that can survive in those regions. Uh, a couple other ones that you're going to want to know about as far as nutrients go, this is a big one that comes up a lot because it's kind of a, a misconception um, that a lot of students have is that the tropical rainforest actually has really crappy soil. It's really bad. It's nutrient poor um, because there's high competition from so many different plant species that the soil is just bad. It just doesn't have a lot of nutrients. Um, so another thing that happens is that it rains so much there that all of the the nutrients that do start to build up get washed away very quickly. The boreal forest is ultra, also nutrient poor. Um, lower temperatures, you know, this is very similar to the taiga, the, the ta or excuse me, the tundra. Um, the tundra is just completely frozen. Boreal forest, ultra, also called the taiga, um, is similar, but you get a little bit taller shrubs. Um, but because it's low temperature, low decomposition, it, the nutrients are just not great in the soil. Compared to all of that, you have the temperate forest, though, which is nutrient rich. So lots of dead organic material, tons of leaves because there's lots of trees. And then the warm temperature and moisture means decomposition is great. And all of that goes into the soil, which leads to lots of uh, good nutrients in the soil. Okay, so all these biomes that we were talking about when we were discussing that map earlier, they can move, um, and they have before and they will again. So biomes shift in location depending on the climate because it's the climate that makes the biome. So for example, if the warming climate will shift boreal forests north um, as that permafrost melts, the lower latitudes become too warm for the aspen and the spruce in those regions. So let's take a look at this. So this is the current climate zone for aspen trees. Um, so you have the range here of the aspen trees. This is the core of those aspen trees, so the vast majority here. This is from 1971 to 2000. So this is the this was the current um, area where the aspen where aspen trees grow. As the climate warms though, um, it's going to shift those aspen trees further north because this area down here, or what, what was down here, is too warm. And um, the, the aspen and then spruce can't grow in those areas. So they start shifting to areas where they can grow. And so this is from 2071 to 2100. This is what we estimate will happen. Look how far north that biome has shifted um, because, again, it's not trees like picking up their tree legs and walking there, but the, the seeds that land in these warm areas aren't going to survive, but the ones that land or are spread to colder areas, those will survive because aspen and spruce grow in colder areas. Um, so here's a, a good example of that. So 1962, the, this is what it looked like at that point. Notice not a lot of, not a lot there um, growing. And then 2004, you have those trees that have really sprouted up. So this was low growing. Now you have larger trees in those areas because they do better in warmer weather, which is in that section. Okay, so that's what you need to know for 1.2. So for terrestrial biomes, and then let's quickly talk about 1.3 aquatic biomes. Um, again, we're focusing on by the end of this, you should be able to describe the global distribution and principal environmental aspects of aquatic biomes. The overall skill is to explain environmental concepts and processes. 
And by the end of this, you should be able to uh, know that freshwater biomes include streams, rivers, ponds, and lakes. These freshwater biomes are a vital resource for drinking water. There are also marine biomes, which include oceans, coral reefs, marshlands, estuaries. Um, algae and marine biomes supply a large portion of the Earth's oxygen. It's much larger than what you would think. And they also take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, the ocean is the largest uh, carbon sink. Um, so it's where the vast majority of carbon dioxide is stored is actually in the ocean. And then last, that's just like a side note. <laughs> you do need to know that. We'll talk about that in, in a few more uh, uh, topics, but just throwing that out there because you need to know that too. Um, the global distribution of non-mineral marine resources, natural resources, such as different types of fish, varies because of a combination of salinity, depth, turbidity, nutrient availability, availability, and temperature. So let's talk about those um, characteristics. So characteristics of aquatic biomes. There are four of them here that we'll talk about. Um, there were more listed in the um, in that definition, like something called turbidity. We're not going to talk about that really today, but we will get into all of those. So here's what makes up different um, aquatic biomes. So when you have differences in salinity, depth, flow, and temperature, it changes a biome. So salinity has to do with salt. So how much salt there is in a body of water determines which species can survive there. And then how much can, how, how much can we drink from it? So fresh water is what we want to drink. Um, that is what, we, that is what we, we drink. That is what organisms drink. That's what humans drink. Um, but then you have different levels of salinity. So estuary is a mixture of salt and fresh water. And then an ocean is just salt water depth so this comes down to light penetration so the the depth of the water um, influences how much sunlight can penetrate down and then reach plants below the surface for photosynthesis so certain areas uh, the sunlight can reach much further than others the flow of the uh, aquatic biome. So this determines which plants and organisms can survive um, and how much water, excuse me, how much uh, oxygen can dissolve into water. The higher the flow, the lower the O2. Um, and if there's a really high flow, plants and organisms have to be able to be kind of attach themselves to things so they don't get swept down a, a, you know, a fast moving river if they're not um, adapted to a fast moving river, for example. And then temperature, the warmer water, uh, the warmer the water there is, it holds less dissolved oxygen, so it can support fewer aquatic organisms. Remember, aquatic organisms do need oxygen to survive. Um, and so the warmer water, it actually holds less oxygen um, and therefore more or less organisms can survive in those areas. All right, let's talk about freshwater, specifically rivers and lakes. So rivers have high oxygen due to the flow mixing water and air. Um, so that faster it moves, the more, the higher the oxygen there is. Um, and it's also a bit, rivers are generally a little bit colder. Um, they also carry nutrient rich sediments. So like deltas and floodplains means fertile soil, which means plants are happy. Um, so rivers have high O2 and then high nutrients. Um, lakes, which are, you know, as, as rivers move, lakes stand, so they don't, they're not shifting anywhere. They're not, they're not flowing. Um, so standing bodies of fresh water, um, this is a key drinking water source for the vast majority of the world, not just for humans, but animals as well. There are different levels to a lake, though, that you need to know about. So there are four different levels to a lake. So starting at the top, um, you have something called the littoral zone. So this is shallow water. So notice along here, very shallow water. It's in mostly norm near the edge of, of the shore of the lake with something that are called emergent plants. So these are plants that grow just along the shoreline right there. It's, you can... You're, if, when you walk into a lake, that's generally the region that you are standing in. Um, littoral zone, um, as you can imagine, gets all the sunlight. Notice, as this picture shows, the levels of sunlight, which determines photosynthesis. So all these plants are getting a huge amount of sunlight, lots of photosynthesis, ha photosynthesis happening in the littoral zone. 
The next zone is the limnetic zone. This is where light can reach um, photosynthesis wise. Light can, light can get down here, but there's no rooted plants. So this is happening, the, the photosynthesis is only happening for phytoplankton that are in the water. The profundal zone is too deep for sunlight. So we're talking about down here, no photosynthesis is occurring in the profundal zone. And then lastly, the benthic zone is the bottom where, um, where you get a lot of sediment, um, a lot of um, murkiness, um, bugs will live there, um, but you have a ton of good nutrients. That's kind of where all the good nutrients hang out is at the very, very bottom. So that's fresh water talking about rivers and lakes. Now let's talk about fresh water when it comes to wetlands. Um, so what is a wetland? Wetland is an area with soil that's submerged or saturated in water for at least part of a year. So it means it's, it's being covered for at least part of the year, but you still have emergent plants that grow in that area. So it's not super deep. Plants living here have to be adapted to living with roots submerged in standing water. So because it's submerged for at least part of the year, it can't be a plant that's used to, um, you know, being in soil but no water. It has to be able to cope with that water. So some examples are cattails, lily pads, and reeds. There are a lot of benefits to wetlands. Wetlands are extremely important for the environment. Um, we'll get into those a little bit more um, when we talk about uh, uh, terrestrial, or excuse me, aquatic pollution um, and the importance of wetlands. So knowing these, these benefits of wetlands is, is a big deal. So make sure you get these down. Um, so why we need wetlands. Um, Wetlands store excess water during storms. Um, so when we remove wetlands from an area, for example, when humans go in and, and uh, clear out an area that was at one point a wetland um, and build something there, like, a, like a, an apartment complex, for example, um, you get a ton of flooding in that area because those wetlands are, used, are, are really there to help lessen that flooding. All of those plants there um, help control that water situation um, because they are storing that excess water. Um, wetlands also recharge um, or refill groundwater by absorbing rainfall into the soil. The roots of wetland plants filter pollutants from water draining through so they act as a filter and, um, and filter out all those pollutants. And high plant growth is, is happening in wetlands due to lots of water and nutrients. There's tons of dead organic material um, in the sediments. And so uh, uh, there's a lot of nutrients and lots of plant growth in wetland areas. So there are three um, wetland areas that you'll want to know about. Um, you have a swamp. Um, the thing that makes a swamp a swamp is that you have large trees. So this is why a swamp is what, what it is versus these other two that we'll talk about in a minute, is you have large cypress trees. Um, they, you can tell they're cypresses because of the way that the, the, the bottom of the tree right here um, is, is kind of, you have these lines almost on here and then underneath are where the roots are. So remember, I just said, if we go back, um, plants have to be adapted to living submerged in water. That's a tree living submerged in water. Okay. So cypress trees in a swamp. You also have a marsh. Um, here are reeds and cattails um, and the reeds and then cattails are all in there. And then the other, the third wetland area is a bog. Um, here you see spruce trees in the back and then sphagnum moss. Um, so this is all moss that is in this area here. And it is again, submerged in water at least half the year. So those are the three different types of wetland areas. You then have a mixture area. So these are, this is something called an estuary. This is where rivers empty into the ocean. So it's really important to know that this is where you get a mixture of fresh water and salt water because we've been talking about fresh water. Now we have some salt water mixing in there. So again, species have to be adapted to this. The big one that you need to know, you have to know this, this comes up all the time on the AP test, mangrove trees. Um, I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. So um, mangrove trees um, are highly adapted to living in estuaries. You have high productivity. We're going to talk about productivity um, in a few uh, uh, 
days you'll do a lab actually over productivity but productivity basically means plant growth okay so you have a high amount of plant growth in an estuary due to the nutrients in the sediments um, deposited by estuary in estuaries by the river so river will move those sediments into an estuary area and then all those sediments will just build up um, and leads to lots and lots of nutrients the plants are really happy because they have everything they need to grow so there are um, they're talking about different types of estuaries there's something called a salt marsh this is an estuary habitat along a coastline in temperate climates um, salt marshes are great breeding grounds for many fish and shellfish species this is what a salt marsh looks like. Um, it's very flat. Um, there's not a lot of trees in the area, but you do, because again, we're talking about an area that has a lot of water in it uh, most of the time. So you have shorter areas. Um, and this is a great nesting or breeding ground for fish and shellfish. They love hanging out here where um, you get that mixture of fresh water and salt water. And then you have mangrove swamps. So mangrove swamps, um, are estuary habitats along co the coast of tropical climates. And these mangrove trees um, have long stilt-like roots um, that hold the shoreline together and then provide a habitat for many organisms of fish and shellfish. Here's what that looks like. So all of these sticking out are roots. These are mangrove trees um, and they are holding a shoreline together. So if you remove these trees, that shoreline pretty much collapses. All right, now we're into the marine area um, where we're talking about coral reefs. So coral reefs are warm, shallow waters beyond the shoreline. Um, they are the most diverse marine um, biome on earth. Um, when we're talking about marine, we are talking about ocean. So we use the term marine, but we're talking about oceans. We're just saying salty. So either one is fine, but you're gonna see marine more often. Um, so most diverse biome on earth. Um, when it comes to uh, salt water. Um, we again, this is, we just talked about this, this is where you see the mutualistic relationship between coral and algae. So let's get into that in just a little bit more because you do, you do need to know the, the example here. So um, again, coral is taking carbon dioxide out of the ocean since carbon dioxide is the, is held, there's a the excuse me let me rephrase the ocean is the area that has the most co2 so it holds the most carbon dioxide in there so coral um will and take that in and then create calcium carbonate exoskeletons that's why coral it looks like this it's all calcium carbonate so calcium carbonate um, that's where that carbon is coming from um, this is the reef that they're building and then it also provides uh, that carbon dioxide to the algae that are growing on it and then they provide and then remember that that algae provides the the coral with the sugars that it needs to survive so the algae live in the reef and then provide that energy to the coral through photosynthesis that the algae goes through and both species rely on one another which is why it's a mutualistic relationship coral couldn't survive without energy from the algae and the algae needs the home of the reef and the co2 from the coral in order to survive itself you have an area um, of marine uh, called an intertidal zone so these are narrow bands of coastline between high tide and low tide so remember that the ocean has a high tide and a low tide and that water moves in and out and in and out um, so this is along the coastline so if you see here in this picture we're really going to be focusing on this picture um, this top area notice it's out of the water um, so this is along the coast okay so this would be like where you would stand if you walked along the edge of, of a coast in the ocean that's that's where you're at okay um, Organisms have to be adapt adapted to this area because this area, it's high and low tide. It, the water's moving in and out all the time, so the waves are crashing. Um, when it's low tide, there's direct sunlight and heat, um, so the organisms have to be able to cope with that. So organisms that live in this area are barnacles, sea stars, crabs that can like just attach themselves to the rock. So all of these little um, things right here, these are all barnacles. They're tiny little barnacles. Um, then you have some sea stars that are attached there. They're sucked to that rock. And as, as you can see, this is low tide. There's no water here right now, but as the water moves back in, they'll be covered up, okay? So they have to be able to be adapted to such things. 
So really, organisms that do well in intertidal zones have shells and tough outer skin that can prevent drying out. That's also called desiccation um, during that low tide. Different organisms are adapted to different zones, though they don't all, they're not all able to cope with, with being totally dried out. Um, so, um, so for example, the spiral rack, um, which is right here, okay, right here, um, it's a type of seaweed. It curls up and then secretes mucus to retain water during the low tide. Um, but then you also have these organisms down here that are pretty much always covered up with water um, or at least close to it, but it's not deep water, okay, because this is just a low tide zone. So different organisms are adapted to live in different zones. And then you have the open ocean. Um, this is a low productivity, so low area of plant growth um, as only algae and phytoplankton can survive um, in the ocean because it's open ocean. Um, it's so large though that algae and phytoplankton um, of the ocean produce a lot of the earth's oxygen and absorb a lot of atmospheric co2 so algae and phytoplankton actually produce um, more than half of the oxygen on earth everyone thinks so oh, it's all the trees yeah trees are important plants are obviously extremely important um, but algae and phytoplankton in the ocean produce about half of our oxygen um, and take in a huge amount of CO2. So while we can't see them often with our naked eye, they are very important to our environment. So in the open ocean, you have different zones, just like you have in a lake. Um, so you have the photic zone. Um, this is a sunlit area, so area where sunlight can reach. Um, so here again is the coastline. You have the intertidal zone along here where you get high and low tide. And then remember, we're talking about the open ocean, so there's no land underneath here. So you have the photic zone that goes down about 200 meters, um, and sunlight is reaching all of these areas where algae and phytoplankton are able to perform photosynthesis. You have the aphotic zone, which is below that, also called the abyssal zone. Um, this area does not get enough sunlight for phytoplankton to or or algae to survive so this is an area that's too deep for sunlight um, in the aphotic zone this is where you get your really cool crazy organisms um, you've seen this if you watched finding nemo and um, that's the little guy with the with the light above his head it's actually a female um, and then you have um, organisms that bioluminesce so that can can create their own light um, using generally it's bacteria um, inside their body. Um, sometimes it's, it's something called the dinoflagellate that creates it. It's a little complicated, but anyway, so they can create light um, because they are, uh, they're in a very, very dark area of the open ocean. And that is it for topic uh, 1.3 about um, aquatic biomes. So hopefully you uh, took good notes over all of those and you're adding that to your existing notes. Again, we did not, uh, you did not have a video over topic 1.1. So make sure that you took good notes over all of that. Uh, and I hope you got something out of this and enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.